Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? My name is Tom, and I get to be one of the pastors around here, and uh, I'm excited to have y'all here, and we've got a great message today I think you're going to really enjoy. In fact, I bet there's a question that every single one of you in this room has asked at one time or another, maybe even today, and that question, probably one of the most asked questions all around the world, and probably one of the most confusing questions that we can possibly ask is what am I supposed to do? Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and I don't suppose that all of you are, I know we always have tire kickers here, people that are kind of testing the waters to see if, if Christianity is something that they want to embrace or not. And if that's you, I'm certainly glad that you're here, and uh, we planned on you being here, so sit back and make yourself at home. Uh, but if you are here today and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the way that you would most likely ask that question is what does God want? Want me to do, or what is God's will? Now, the thought that there's something that I'm supposed to do directly implies that there is an entity that has determined what I am supposed to do. And the fact that I'm asking the question, what am I supposed to do, reveals that I don't know the answer. And that is the tension that so many people live with. And for some people, it can be paralyzing. But I would like to, I would like to, to express it this way. My own personal opinion is when we live like that, that's actually a cruel way to live your life. The idea that God has determined exactly what it is that you're supposed to do in any and every moment, any and every situation in life, but he has not revealed it to you, and yet he will hold you accountable for that. That, that to me, I can't imagine living my life that way, living with that, that constant fear that I'm going to turn left when God wanted me to turn right on my way home from, from work. But that is, that is the question that so many folks have. So let me ask you guys this. How do you live in God's will? All right? We want to be in God's will, but what exactly is that? What does that mean, and how do we do it? Now, this is an important question because a lot of people, many followers of Jesus Christ, live paralyzed lives when it comes to making decisions. And whether they admit it or not, they're fearful, and maybe some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, fearful of disobeying God in, in any opportunity that's facing you. And so we, we may ask God, give us a directive. You know, give me a sign. Show me what to do. Things like go to this school or take this job or quit this job. Start dating that guy. Ask, ask that woman to marry you. Rent this apartment. Sign up with this particular internet provider and not that one. You know, switch from Verizon to T-Mobile. That's actually a good one, by the way. <laughs> I'm saving $1,500 a year by switching. So, yeah, if you work for Verizon, I'm sorry. You know, shop at this grocery store, have this many kids, or have no kids, so on and so forth. I actually once knew a Christian man who told me the most bizarre story, and it had to do with his relationship with his wife, his very godly Christian wife, who was the mother of his children. They were struggling in their relationship, and he, he found a pastor he kind of pastor shopped looking for an opinion, and, and he went to this pastor, and he said, what, what do I do? What is God's will? Because I have a horrible relationship, and, and I want out of it. And the pastor said to him, now, you've been married for a couple of decades, but when you got married, are you sure, absolutely sure, that God wanted you to marry that woman? And he said, no, it just seemed logical because she was my best friend from high school, and we decided to get married. He goes, see, that's your problem. You are disobeying God because you married a woman God never intended for you to marry. And the only way to rectify the situation would be to divorce her and go find the woman that you were supposed to marry in the first place. And he did. And he abandoned his family. Absolutely insane. I couldn't believe it, but I heard it with my very ears from his mouth. You know, God's way is much better. And it's, it's in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The author wrote, trust in the Lord with 
all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him. And what does it say next? And he will make your paths straight. The fact that he makes them straight means the pathway in front of you is crooked. So this is an act of God that he does as we submit to him. Now, I've been a Christian for 34 years. As of a week ago, 34 years, that was my spiritual birthday last, last Sunday. And I can tell you, when I turn around in my life and I look backwards from whence I came from the day I got saved, I see a straight pathway all the way through it, all the way into the distance, all the way back, where, where God has straightened a pathway for me throughout all of those years. But I can also tell you this, at any moment in time, as I looked forward into the future in front of me and all of the decisions that needed to, to be made, all I could see was crooked roads, potholes, mountain ranges, rivers blocking the way, and bridges, metaphorically, that were washed out. It's very easy for us to look backwards and see what God has done, but it's hard for us to look at the obstacles in front of us with, with a faith that trusts that no matter what comes our way, God is carving that path. God is creating that straight path for us, even if we can't see it. Now, nowhere... Nowhere in Scripture does God promise us that we will know the very next thing that we're supposed to do. Nowhere. In fact, I might make some enemies, and if you, dis dis if you don't agree with me, that's perfectly fine because you don't need to agree with me. It's okay we're, we're, if we choose to disagree. Uh, but God does not promise us directional promptings. I know a lot of people believe that. I need to do something, God's going to give me a sign. God's going to give me a direction. God's going to give me some kind of physical sensation in my body, you know, the buzzing of the tailbone, and I will know what it is that I'm supposed to do. The scriptures do not promise that. To submit to God in all of our ways means that regardless of our circumstances, we live in such a way, we make decisions in such a way that we are honoring God. We are honoring God in the way that we live our life. God is far more concerned with how you do what it is that you do than he is with what you actually do. So we don't need to worry about taking a right-hand turn or a left-hand turn on the way home from work. We just need to make a decision which direction we would like to go. Now, welcome back to part two of our Ruth series. This is going to carry on through the whole month of November. Last week, we were introduced to a, a, a Jewish woman named Naomi and her, her daughter-in-laws, uh, Ruth and, and Orpah. And Ruth in Orpah, their husbands died, Naomi's husband died, and her daughter-in-laws, one of them, decided to go back to Israel with her because they were living in the land of Moab because they were escaping a, a famine. So these two women, they return to Israel as despairing widows. And in that culture, it was extremely difficult for women under such a situation, especially with no, no children to help them out, to, to, to make a living, to carve their way through life. So Naomi, she's trying to figure out, how, how do I provide for myself and my daughter-in-law? And more also important, how do I secure my own property the property of my husband into the family, into the next generation. So that's what's happening. And in this beginning portion today, we're going to be introduced to a man named Boaz, okay? And he becomes a key figure in this story all the way through to chapter 4. We see him in chapter 2, verse 1. It says that Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan, the family of Elimelech. That's her, that's her departed husband. And the man's name was Boaz. So Boaz is a man of standing in this community. He's also a man of wealth. He's a man of God, and he's an eligible bachelor. He, and important to the story, he's a close relative of Naomi's deceased husband. 
we're going to come back to that idea multiple times before we finish out week four. But what we see is, aside from going back to Jerusalem, or back to Bethlehem, back to the, the land of Israel, Naomi doesn't have a plan. She's depressed, and depression can, can kind of do that to you. So, during the, the harvest season is when they returned, probably the, the, the end of the March time frame of the year. Uh, they, had, they had an interesting practice in Israel. Whenever you, you harvested your crops, the law did not allow you to take the corners of your fields. You, have, you had to leave that. And once you went over a tree or a, or a vine or any kind of uh, fruit producing, vegetable producing plant, you... Once you went over it one time, you were not allowed to go over it a second time. Anything left in the fields or in the corners of the fields or on the branches or on the vines, it was, it was for the poor of the community. That was one of God's systems of, of welfare. The poor could come in and they could harvest what was remaining in the fields. We call it gleaning. They would go in and they would glean what remained. And, and so that's what you're going to see ends up happening here. We're going to pick up again in chapter 2. Two, verses 2 through 4, it says that Ruth, the Moabite, that's constantly stressed, she's not a Jewish woman, she, she said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and, and pick up leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. All right? She's, she doesn't have a plan other than she's going to go and she's going to look for a field. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out And she entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. Now, if you like circling stuff in your Bible, please circle this phrase right here. As it turned out. That might be the most liberating thought that you're ever going to hear in your life apart from the salvation of your soul through Jesus Christ. As it turned out. All right? She was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, and he greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Now, while verse 1 reveals to us that Boaz is a near relative of Naomi's deceased husband, uh, Ruth does not know that. Okay? She does not know that. All Ruth knows is that she needs to find a field where she can glean so that she can provide some resources for her and Naomi to live off of. Now, without inquiring of God, what field do I glean in? She just happened to find herself in the field of Boaz as it turned out. All right? Boaz takes notice of her, and by the way, when, when God's plan begins to unfold around you, whether you realize that it's unfolding or not, whether you can see God's hand at work in your circumstances, God is working behind the scenes, and we, ha- we have a word for that. We call it providence. God is providentially working in the situation that you're experiencing. So God has a plan, but God does not need to supernaturally reveal to us his plan in order for us to do the things that God wants for us to do. And what you're going to discover here in just a second, and what we're going to continue looking at for the next couple of weeks as well, is, is, is that God's plan here is wrapped up in his revealed truth, the Old Testament law. But again, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So let's continue reading in verse 5. Boaz asked the, uh, the, the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? So he doesn't know her. And the overseer replied, oh, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Evidently, people were hearing about Naomi in this, this Moabite, this, this foreign woman uh, named Ruth, but he, he had not laid eyes on her yet. And uh, the, she says to him, she said, or she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz then approaches Ruth and he says to her, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow 
follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink of water from the jars that the men have filled. Now, as a near relative of Ruth's deceased husband, Boaz could be legally obligated to help them out, and he knows this. He knows this now that he knows who she is, but what's interesting, being the upstanding man that he is, he, he does not wait for the law to be triggered. He immediately begins taking Ruth and Naomi under his protection, and, and he starts taking care of them, providing for them. And we, again, we clearly see God's hand working in this situation. So I'd, I'd like you to note this. Whether we see God's hand working in a situation or not, God cares for the vulnerable in society. God cares for the vulnerable in society. Now, here is how Ruth responds to the kindness of Boaz. Let's pick up in verse 10. It says that this, Ruth bowed down with her face to the ground and, and she asked him, she asked Boaz, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about you that what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and you came to live with a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of, un of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in, in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You, you have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she ha sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all that she wanted and, sh and had some left over. And as she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves, and sheaves do not reprimand her. Even pull out some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. Now, this is going beyond the legal requirement. The legal requirement at this point in time is, is that he allows her to glean in his field. This is now an act of charity on top of a legal obligation. And what's interesting about this system is, is it, it was more like workfare than welfare. It gave people the dignity of work and self-provision, and it provided some of what they needed. So look what ends up happening. Ruth goes back later in the evening to Naomi, and, and we're going to see this here in verse 17 through 20. It says that Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, and then she threshed the barley that she had, she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town to her mother-in-law, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered, and Ruth, Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had, had left over after she had eaten. That was that roasted grain. And her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And then Ruth told, told her mother-in-law about, uh, about the one at whose place that she had been working. In the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, right? As it turned out, it just so happened she ends up working with Boaz. And then she said, the Lord bless him. T Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not show stopped showing his kindness to the living or to the dead. And then she added, this man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Now, this woman has been in a state of depression since her husband and her sons died. She, she, when, when she returned to Israel, they said, they said, look, Naomi has returned. And she said, don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. She said, call me Mara because, because the Lord has made me bitter. She's been depressed and, and brokenhearted. And in my mind, I just envision her clasping the hands of Ruth, squeezing the blood out of them, and jumping for joy with a smile on her face, the first smile in, in years, it, expressing to her that God is helping us, that, that this situation now has a light at the end of the tunnel. So there's an interesting phrase here. That phrase, 
guardian redeemer. Now, a guardian redeemer was a, a close relative who can step in and give provision and protection to a family member in need. And Ruth and Naomi are certainly, certainly in need. And Boaz is already, without legal obligation, he's already, as I said, he's meeting it. And we see this in this barley. After she had threshed it and all that remained were, were the grains it amounted to an ephah, an ephah of grains. That's roughly 39 U.S. courts. That is an extremely generous gift from Boaz, and that will allow Ruth and Naomi to take that grain, what they don't themselves consume, take it to the market and barter for the other things that they need. Now, what we see happening is the story is taking a turn. It is a turn in the trajectory of Naomi and Ruth's life, and it's also a turn in Naomi's heart because, again, she begins to see that there is a pleasant solution to their current predicament. And that solution to their troubles is actually wrapped up in some additional legal requirements from the Old Testament as it is related to land. Now, you have to remember, Israel is referred to, that portion of the world is referred to as the promised land. It's called the promised land for multiple reasons. For one thing, it is the land that God promised Abraham that his descendants would eventually possess, and there they would grow into a powerful nation. It is also the land wherein God said he would bring forth a blessing, a child who would be a blessing to the entire world, and that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's also the promised land because that land of Israel that's under so much contention right now, that land of Israel is the exact place where Jesus Christ promised that he was going to return. He is going to set his feet upon the Mount of Olives one day in the future, and he is going to walk right on in through the east gate into the temple at the Temple Mount. That is the promise of God. So land is extremely important to anybody uh, of, of Jewish heritage or ancestry. Now, Note this then, in ancient Jewish culture, a family's identity was tied to its land. By God's law, land had to stay within the family. Even if it was sold, it would eventually come back to the family decades down the road in on the, the year of Jubilee, what they called it. Now, the issue that Naomi and Ruth face here right off the bat is that they are broke. They don't have money. They don't have the, the necessary resources or the work power to invest into that land and to, and to make it profitable so that it would be providing for them. And on top of that, there is no male descendant for that land to eventually uh, be granted to through inheritance. So this is a pretty serious dilemma that they, that they are, are facing. And the only solution available is that a near relative to Elimelech would fulfill the legal requirements of the guardian redeemer. And Boaz, we learn, is just such a person. He is someone who can possibly fulfill that role. So, look at verse 21. It says, Then Ruth the Moabite said, He... Boaz even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting my grain. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because someone, in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the woman, to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, I want to come back to this idea of navigating God's will. Neither Naomi or Ruth appear to be openly asking, what is your will, God? What is your will? What are you going to do? Do I turn left? Do I turn right? They, they had a need, and that need required action. Inaction meant certain death from, from star, starvation. This was n not a society that, you know, had, had many ways to fall back and provide for yourself when you were in need. So, Ruth takes matters into her own hands and she literally goes out and begins to beat the bush 
looking for a solution. Now, there were lots of, lots of fields to glean in all around Bethlehem. There were lots of fields that she could have chosen, but with no insight at all from God as to which field would be the one that she should glean in, she ended up by her own will, by her own actions, in the field of Boaz. And again, she didn't know that Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, guardian redeemer at the time. She did not know that he could solve her problems. She did not know that he would make sure that she took home extra grain. She did not know that he would offer her protection, shelter, food, and refreshment when she needed it. She simply knew that she had to find some way to gather provisions for her and Naomi. And as it turned out, she ends up exactly where God wants her to be, and she didn't even know it. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, can it really be that easy discovering God's will? Because it certainly doesn't seem that easy to discover God's will. Well, let me, let me ask you a, a question here, a couple questions. Would you prefer to serve a God that has this explicit will for your life that he will hold you accountable to but does not reveal to you? And yet he has exact things that you must do at exact moments in time. And, and if you don't do it, again, you will be held accountable. Would you like to serve a God like that? Or would you rather devote yourself to and delight in a God who created you, who molded you mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually to be a very specific person, who gave you very certain skills, desires, likes and dislikes along the way, who created you to be naturally attracted to something and naturally repulsed by other things, and who gave you a brain and even made common sense available, and he simply expects for you to make a good decision and you can make whatever decision you want to make in most circumstances. Which kind of a God would you like to serve? Because you can't serve them both. You, you can serve one or, or, or the other. You can, you can serve a God who, who, who created you to have decision-making capacity and who wishes for you to make, make good decisions, which I'll explain to you in just a moment. Or you can serve a God who wants you to live in absolute terror at every moment that you end up turning left when you should should have turned right. Which one do you want to serve? You know, should, should I glean in the field on the left? Should I glean in the field on the right? And, and what if while we're doing all of that, what if while we're vacillating between making a decision because we need some kind of prompting or, or leading from God so that we'll know the exact thing that we're supposed to do, what if, what if while we're struggling with all of that, what if God's up in heaven just saying, just, just pick a field? Make a decision. I, I don't care. Pick whichever field you want. You know, trust me, I got this. I can, I can handle this. Now, here's the deal. If God cares more about how we do what it is that we do than he is, again, with, with the things that we're actually doing, then we should care about how we conduct ourselves and what we choose to do as well. And that doesn't mean that we always do what is honoring to God, because we all sin, we all need, you know, constant forgiveness for the, for the failings that we commit along the way, and thankfully God is merciful and gracious along those lines, it's for those of us that have put our faith in, in Christ. But you know, as long as we do what we do in a way that honors God and is in alignment with His Word, Word, we, we are in God's will, okay? That's what it means to be in God's will. And if there is anything, anything specifically that God wants to get done in our life, trust me, he's going to get it done. You will find yourself doing what you need to be doing and being where you need to be being. I know that sounds odd, because God is providentially working in your life, and he's creating those straight paths as you move forward. Now, a couple things to consider when you are making decisions. First of all, God has revealed his character, all right? If you want to know if a decision is in alignment with the character of God, you just got to read his word. Read, read, his, read the Old Testament. Read, read the New Testament. Be familiar with the character of God. The vast majority of the decisions that you make in your life are going to be tied to the character of God. If there's something in front of you that you, you have an opportunity to do or you desire to do and, and God says it's not in accordance with his character, then you, you don't do it. That one's very simple. And 
secondly, if it's a morally neutral decision, then just pick one. Pick, pick one, okay? God's okay with that. And the bottom line is this. If, if, you, if you make decisions that honor God's character, you will always be in his will. Now, I, I don't know about you, but for me, that is absolutely liberating. It, it's certainly not a promise that, you know, when, when, you, when you do things the way that God wants you to do them, that your circumstances are going to suddenly become all rosy. It's, it's not a promise that God's going to re- remove from your life the, the stress and strain and hardship that you're experiencing. We, we, don't, we don't bargain with God and say, if you do this for me, then I'll, I'll live like this for you. No, we, we live for God in good and in difficult circumstances. And, you know, part of having faith in God is believing that God is so powerful, His power is so limitless, that He can actually give us free will to make the decisions that we desire to make, okay, even the bad decisions, while at the same time, He weaves His will into into the fabric of human existence. Through the totality of every human decision, God is still weaving His perfect will. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this story of Ruth, because this is a story of, of how, you, how you lead us. You, you care so deeply about how it is that we do what it is that we do when most of us struggle more with wanting to know exactly what the next thing that we're supposed to do is. But you didn't promise us that in Scripture. It, it takes faith to know that we can make decisions, that we can live in a way that honors you, and that you will make our pathways straight. They may not always be rosy. They might actually sometimes be very difficult. Sometimes when we make decisions, it's going to lead to difficulty, Lord, but the right decision is always the right thing to do. So help us to understand this and to bring honor and glory to you. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.